Right, I think I've solved the technical problem with the assistance of my uh, bikini-clad friend to my right. Uh, not bikini-clad, thankfully for all of us. So, let's just uh, start this again, shall we? Right, what is the aim of this final F8 session? The aim is you have got an exam on Monday, less than three days away. You have a weekend left to sort a few things out. The reason we run these sessions is because we want to give people a chance to ask any final questions. And that's the main reason. This session is for you to ask me. But the other reason we do it is to give me an opportunity and the other tutors opportunities to give you some final guidance as how to spend your final bit of time, what to do on exam morning before you go into the exam centre and what to do when you're sitting there. Imagine this as the boxer about to fight. I'm the trainer whispering things in the ear, motivating, preparing, trying to make sure that you are focusing only on the essentials. Now, these sessions are quite unpredictable. <clears throat> Sometimes a lot of students ask a lot of questions and that makes the thing run the way it's going to run. And sometimes people are a little bit shy at the beginning and it takes a little while for those first questions to appear. So I have things I need and want to tell you about what to do between tonight and that exam on Monday. And I'm gonna do that. But as the questions start building up, I will answer them because the priority is you. So if you've got anything at all, please throw it at me and let me talk to you about F8. This exam is misunderstood by a lot of people. If I hear another person say, oh, audit, that's a theory paper, I'm gonna get very upset. It doesn't take too much research to realize very quickly that this exam is about two thirds practical marks and about one third knowledge. So if you have swallowed or memorized the textbook and you know every audit standard inside out, I'm delighted for you. I bet you're a lot of fun at parties. Uh, I also know the audit standards inside out. I am a lot of fun at parties, but the knowledge is not going to get you through the exam because there's only one third of it getting you marks. You've got to be good at the practical. Now, the examiner seems to have made your lives a bit easier recently because the exam structure now, with only three long questions, means those three long questions are likely to be very heavily dominated by only three core areas. In the past, we've had up to six long questions, and that meant several different techniques to master. But a lot of the stuff that would normally have been in a long written question is probably now mostly going to appear as MCQs, which means if you know it, you'll get the reward, even if you're not very good at explaining it, because you don't have to explain it, just do it. So my main focus to prepare you for that exam on Monday is think practical. Tip number one. A very good habit to get into in any exam, uh, especially this one, is explain. Explain every point you make. So for example, if you are writing out any test at all, which is a substantive procedure of some sort, then you are trying to prove, verify the numbers, the disclosures in the accounts. So why not write? somewhere in your answer to verify because that will force you to say what it is you're trying to check what it is you're trying to prove 
And if you do explain each suggestion, it soon means that instead of writing five or six words, you end up writing about 15, 20, 25 words. Let me prove the point to you. Here we go. Explain each suggestion point you make. But I've not said why, have I? Which means at the moment, what I've written up there in blue, up on that screen, will only score me half a mark. If I then say, explain each suggestion point you make, because markers give half for saying something and another half for why, then suddenly we've now got a longer answer up there which is going to pick up more marks. So rule number one, get in the habit of explaining everything you say. Point number two. Be as specific as you can. One of the words I hate, inspect documentation, is going to leave me, your marker, saying, which document? Discuss with management. Read board minutes. Inspect invoice. Leaves me your marker saying, discuss what and why. Read board minutes. What are you looking for? Inspect invoice. To check what? Invoices have a lot of information on them. Be specific. Uh, these days we mark uh, on a computer screen. And to help justify the marks we are giving, we are required to use a series of buttons which highlight why we're not giving marks to something. Uh, the most common button that gets used is the V button. And the V stands for vague. And on some scripts, you are just doing it over and over and over again. And if you're too vague, you'll score nothing. Be specific. On the subject of uh, board minutes and discussing with management, by the way, don't write that very often. You know the rules on reliability of evidence. It's the worst type of evidence you can get. Surely there's got to be something better than having a chat with management about it. So steer away from it as much as you can. Third and final general tip, be very careful with the dates in questions. Very, very careful. Auditing is a process. At last year's AGM, you were reappointed. Before you were reappointed, you had to decide whether to accept reappointment and presumably, therefore, you considered your ethics before you were even appointed. You would have considered, do I have the resources, the competence, the staff, the time to do this audit they want me to do? Right, now you've been appointed. Now you start planning the audit, strategy first and then down to the detailed plan and assessing controls on an interim audit before the year end. Year end happens, attend the stock take. Send letters to their customers and suppliers and bank to confirm balances. After year end, final audit. Now you've got draft accounts in your hand because the year is finished. Now you focus on substantive procedures and towards the end you finalise and issue your report. <coughs> the dates will help tell you where in the process you are and it's part of the thing that's being tested on the exam. Give you a specific example. You are sitting your exam on March the 6th, 2017. If the story says 
on February the 18th, 2017, there was an earthquake which destroyed the company's head office. Well, that was only 24 days ago. No, I can't count. 10 plus 6 is 16, Paul. Uh, that was only 16 days ago. That's two bit, two weeks. That mess is still going to be there, isn't there? Now, if it was an earthquake, I'm not sure I really want to go and visit the site because there might be another earthquake soon. But the damage will still be there to be seen. If it said in September 2016 earthquake, well, several months have passed. It's now March 2017. I'm not sure there's any rubbish left to see. Watch the dates in questions carefully. Now, those are some general tips. The three long questions on this exam are likely to be focused very heavily around three core syllabus areas. And all of them are very practical. By this late stage, you should know what I'm about to say, of course, but those three areas are audit risk and response, internal controls, and substantive procedures. These have been the big three core areas on audit exams for years. So there's nothing odd about this. It's all totally predictable. And the questions we get are incredibly repetitive and look very familiar and similar to previous sittings. There are well-known and well-tried issues and techniques for how you go about doing this. Don't question it, just do it. Let's start with audit risk and response. You know what audit risk is. It's the risk, the accounts are materially misstated, and the auditor's substantive tests fail to detect that. On exam day, most of the audit risks in the story tend to be risks of material misstatements, and that is where your effort needs to focus. And when you are explaining risks of material misstatement, you need to be specific. You need to tell me which financial statement items you think are at risk. You need to try to specify whether you think that number is likely to be too high or too low. If it's a disclosure note, maybe this is a contingent liability, for example. Presumably, the risk is going to be under disclosure, but be specific. And probably the hardest bit, especially for an F8 student, is you've then got to explain why. And the problem with explaining why is it might mean you've got to use some accounting rules. And if your accounting knowledge is not very good, it's going to be difficult to explain that. Having said that, you can explain a lot of risks using common sense. I'll give you an example. There's a court case against your client. Hopefully, you realise this is about provisions. Or maybe contingent liabilities. If you think a payout is probable, you should be saying provisions. If you think a payout is possible, it's contingent liability. And at this stage, what is the risk? The risk is they put a contingent liability in, it should be a provision. Or more likely, the risk is they don't say anything in the accounts. And why wouldn't they say anything? Because they don't want the world to know they're being prosecuted or sued. Because it's bad for reputation. That would be a good enough explanation. There's a risk that this matter, this claim, is not mentioned in the accounts as a provision or a contingent liability because they don't want to publicise the fact that they might have been naughty boys and girls. And that is how you explain risks 
of material misstatement, which is the biggest bit of audit risk. You've got to tell me why the accounts might be wrong. The other bit of the question that you've got to answer is come up with responses to risk. Responses will sometimes be specific tests you would carry out. Uh, if you're not sure what's going on with a legal case, I'd be asking a lawyer myself. Sometimes it's about which staff to use on the audit. So if they've got complicated stuff, complicated inventory to value, work in progress, use an expert, for example. Internal controls. With internal controls, the three key things that you need to understand are control objectives, control procedures, and tests of control. Ah, we have a question from Facebook. What are the core topics of the F8 paper? Uh, Michael, they're up here. Now, I could easily argue there are a few more than three, but the paper is divided between the multiple choice questions and the long questions. Multiple choice could be on absolutely anything. The three long questions are going to be heavily based around these three things. So there are other topics. But if you want the Premier League of topics for F8, it's these three babies up here. And thank you for asking. Right, so internal controls, three key skills. What is a control objective? It's anything that you're trying to achieve. So to ensure we pay our staff the right amounts. We send the right goods to customers. We only accept goods from suppliers that are good quality. To ensure our assets are not stolen. It's stuff like that. Let's go with that last one. Assets not stolen. What is a control procedure? It is anything you do to try and achieve the objective. That could be a reconciliation. It could be computer controls. It could be physical controls, and on that subject, control procedure, uh, I think I would uh, employ security guards and have an alarm system. There you go, two physical controls. <coughs> Uh, I'll come back to your question in a minute, Sai. I marked your mock exam, didn't I? If you've not seen it yet, it's up on uh, the platform, okay? Assuming you are the same person. Can't be too many people with that name. Uh, tests of control. This is what the auditor does to see if the procedures are happening. So in these two cases, how do you know there are security guards? How do you know there's an alarm system? I would observe the guards on the site. And I suppose if you want to know if there's an alarm system, and if you want to know if there's security guards, try to break in, see if you can trip the system into actually operating. Okay, uh, now we're not quite finished on controls yet, but the questions are now coming thick and fast. Uh, predictions, or the core topics are the ones to be tested. Uh, well, there are predictions and tips. Uh, the tips are always the core areas because they're bound to be there, plus some other bits and pieces as well. Uh, can I suggest at this point uh, the easiest way to get hold of 
uh, my tips for F8 is to go to pqmagazine.com, PQ for Park Qualified, and PQ, the lovely people who gave us, oh, let's put it in front there, this lovely award. Thank you, PQ. Uh, because pqmagazine.com uh, publish uh, tips from colleges in advance of each sitting, uh, and the F8 tips in PQ Magazine from LSBF are my tips. So the easiest thing, go to the website, click on uh, the copy of the magazine on the left, flick through the pages, and you will find our tips. Uh, question from Siv from Facebook. Can I use the same materials I had when I was preparing for December 2016 exams? Is the syllabus still the same? Yes, it is. Uh, the syllabus for F8 changes after the June exam each year, and then we have four sittings, doesn't change. So, yep, you're absolutely fine. Um, just one little thing I would say. It's always a good idea to use the most recent materials if you can, because colleges are always trying to improve, and sometimes when new things hit the syllabus, or there are technical changes, Sometimes a bit of a conversation with the examiner, you read the exam report and you realise where the examiner's coming from a bit better. But you should be fine using December 16, yes. Uh, and uh, while I remember, uh, so far at least, and I doubt there'll be any now, no new examiner articles since the December exam. The most recent article on ACCA Global is on uh, changes to financial statement assertions that happened before the September sitting. So no syllabus changes to worry about. Oh, by the way, since I have mentioned PQ Magazine, um, there is an article in the current issue uh, all about audit reports and the changes that have happened fairly recently. Uh, it's a really useful article. It's got a nice example in it. Hopefully the explanations are nice and clear. And it was written by me, uh, so if you want some help with audit reports, a topic I'm sure I will end up talking about shortly, go read the article. So internal controls, there are three key skills you need to master. Objectives, procedures, tests. The most common exam question style with controls... Not the only type of question, but the most common tends to be a scenario and you have got to highlight the control deficiencies and then make recommendations to improve them. A couple of tips at this point. <clears throat> explain everything, yes? So the deficiencies need to be explained. When you explain them, Explain them in terms of the damage that could potentially happen to the company. So try to be specific. Simple example, uh, when goods arrive, they're not checked for quality. Fine. Therefore, you might accept bad quality goods. Well, duh, I can work that out. So what? If you accept bad quality materials, they could clog up your machinery, causing big repair bills. If your machinery is clogged up, your production stops, causing delays, extra cost, and potentially upset customers because things have been delayed. And poor quality materials feed into poor quality goods that you then send your customers, upset customers. Now you can't write all of that down. There's only a mark for each deficiency but try and put some of it down and give it a bit of colour. When you are explaining your recommendations, try to add. The danger is, you say, deficiency. Goods are not checked for quality when they arrive. Recommendation, check goods for quality when they arrive. You're just repeating the same thing again. Try and say who should check, how should they check, when should they check, how often should they check. 
So I might write something like uh, warehouse staff should compare the quality of the goods that have arrived against agreed quality standards in supplier contracts for a sample of each delivery that arrives, preferably when before the driver leaves, if at all possible. Try to add some detail. And then we come to the third one, and usually the one that gets the most marks. So this is really important, and because it's important, we're not squeezing it down the right-hand side of the page, we'll come down here. Substantive questions tend to come in three slightly different flavours. You could get one as basic as what substantive procedures would you do on uh, inventory? And if you get that question, I would be thinking, what assertions about inventory do you think you need to test? And then I would be thinking, what tests can I do? Now officially, if you look at Audit Standard 500, there are about seven possible tests. But for exam purposes, when you're coming up with ideas, five seems to be enough. Think analytical. And if you're thinking analytical and you watch a certain TV advertisement with a large gentleman with a very funny moustache, go compare, you are comparing. Comparing the numbers in the accounts with other useful information to see if the numbers in the accounts look about right. You could be comparing versus last year, comparing versus industry averages, comparing against the budget for the year, for example. Uh, I will come back to you shortly and answer that question, okay? Just finish this list. We get evidence by asking people questions and receiving answers, confirmations. We can inspect things, we can observe things, and it's a bit of a cheat, but we can recalc you late things, which gives us A E I O U, which is the reason we cheat, of course, because those are the five vowels and it makes it a lot easier to remember. <coughs> So if you do get a substantive procedures question on one balance, and that's all it tells you, there may be nothing in the story to help. In which case, think which assertions, A-E-I-O-U, and possibly, just before I answer, oh dear, size question, you might also want to think what evidence is likely to be available. And for this, I use the mnemonic da da three, meaning which specific documents could you look at, which assets might you look at, is it worth asking the directors for a written management representation? Should I be looking in the inventory register, the asset register, the sales day book, the cash book, the general ledger? And should I be asking people outside the company to give me confirmations because third parties tend to be more reliable than internal. Okay, so that's one type of question. I'll come back to that in a minute, but I have some questions to answer. When you have a question of deficiency recommendation and test of control, is there any specific format? Um, you don't have to, uh, but typically if you've got a question that says, deficiency, and for each deficiency you need a recommendation, and for each recommendation a test of control, columns make a lot of sense. If you've got an ethics question, what are the threats and what are the safeguards? Well, the safeguards match the threats, so columns. Audit risk and response, columns. 
So I think quite a few of the questions on this paper, question styles, do lend themselves very well to columns. It's not compulsory, but you can pretty much guarantee the examiner's answer will, so why not? <coughs> Just keep making sure you write proper full sentences, even in a table. Uh, presentation does not earn any marks. You get marks for content. Uh, from Facebook, do you think it is best to do the MCQs first or last? What a very, very good question. I'll tell you my view on that. <clears throat> and it sort of ties into the whole thing I'm doing here up on the screen. My advice to you is this. On the morning of the exam, the only things you should be doing are thinking, how will I answer the risk and response question? How will I answer controls practical questions? How will I answer substantive procedures? And thinking, explain everything, be specific, watch the dates. That's about it. Pure technique, no knowledge. It's too late to plow. If the knowledge isn't there, it's not gonna be there. <coughs> Why do people fail an exam which has very similar questions every single time, is technically not very difficult. Why do people fail? The reason is in the exam hall, you go in focused and ready, and within half an hour, and for some people, two minutes, all the technique disappears. The clock is speeding up, you're panicking, you're writing as fast as you can, and it's chaos. Your window of opportunity is right at the start where you're relatively calm and the technique is still in your head. My advice is when you open up the exam paper for F8, go past the MCQs, go straight to the long questions and write your technique immediately next to each requirement. That way you have got your technique on the page, in front of you, so that when you come back and answer those long questions, which could be some time later, and you're panicking, the technique is there. It's almost as if I've walked up to you in the example, tapped you on the shoulder and said, ah, don't forget, audit risk and response question, think this, write it like that, and it hopefully will set you on the right path. I think that's the first thing you should do in the exam. Now, if you've thought technique and you're ready to go, I'd do the long questions first. As long as you get the technique down, I think you could then go back and do the MCQs. But you know what I think? A lot of students tell me they find it difficult to manage time. If you've got five minutes left and a long question, you've still got to write it out in sentences. If you've got five minutes left and some MCQs, if push comes to shove, you can guess. You can't guess a sentence. You can guess A, B, C, D very quickly. So as a sort of risk management exercise, I think there's a lot of logic in doing the MCQs last. But the main reason is I want you to be focusing on long question technique because the MCQs will go as well as they're going to go, whatever you do. It's the long questions where you can totally crash and burn very, very easily. So I would do the MCQs last if I were you. Uh, the other issue is the MCQs <coughs> could be on anything in the syllabus and one or two of them could be very small minor points. I don't want you sitting there for three hours worrying about an MCQ on a tiny topic that will have no impact on any other answer you write. I say do the small irrelevant stuff at the end and focus on the big core topics while your writing wrist is strong, your panic level is low. That's what I would do. Oh, Julian's a busy boy tonight. Are there any real life examples to help me understand CAM? Yes, there are. I will come back to the very important substantive procedures in a couple of seconds, maybe a couple of minutes. So let's just come down here. <coughs> C 
So key audit matters are a relatively new part of our studies. They relate to companies on stock exchanges only. And are a relatively new section that goes in the audit report. What goes in there? What goes in there are all significant matters that arose on the audit. And since anything significant that arose on the audit would surely have been discussed at length with the audit committee, if audit firms want to know what the key audit matters are that they should be putting into this section, the answer is whatever you discussed at length with the audit committee, because that must be significant. <coughs> In reality, the most likely significant matters are going to be the main risks of the financial statements being materially misstated. And what you are going to put in the key audit matters is what were the issues, in this case the risks, what the auditor did about them, and the conclusions, observations as a result of that work. Now, a slight difficulty here, <coughs> excuse me, maybe two slight difficulties. This is relatively new, so the amount of real world examples you might think might be a little bit on the small side, but also different countries might do this slightly differently because audit reports are not just governed by audit standards, they're part of company law as well. If you want to take a look at this in the UK, we've actually had something pretty similar to this for about three years now. And if you look in any two, uh, 2015 or 2016 annual report of any listed company you can think of, be boring, go Tesco, Sainsbury's, BP, Shell, Unilever, anything at all. Go and look in the audit report and you'll see a big table with columns in it highlighting all the big risks from the audit. That is Key Audit Matters. It's not going to be called Key Audit Matters because in the UK we call it something slightly different, but you don't need to know that. The content is the same. And it's a good thing to do, partly to go and see what this looks like, but also, of course, one of the practical questions worth a lot of marks on this exam is to explain audit risks and give responses. And since most audit risks are the risks of material misstatement, the first two columns of this table are risks and responses. So it's great real-world examples of the stuff you've got to write on your exam. Just one little warning. In real companies, some of the risks will be accounting issues way beyond the knowledge that you need for F8. So don't be scared by them, okay? Some of them are a little bit high level. <coughs> now, I want to finish off this substantive procedures thing. Uh, Madassa Ali, is there any difference between test of control or control test? They are the same thing. The examiner should call them tests of control because they like to be consistent, but they're the same thing. Uh, Julian, what accounting rules am I expected to know? Let me finish the substantive stuff because it's really important and then I'll do that, okay? Right, so one type of question is what substantive procedures on inventory? A second type of question is what substantive procedures to verify valuation of inventory. 
same question, except now you don't get to go through all the assertions. It's specific. And that gives us a big problem because a lot of students miss the word and then give lots of tests that aren't valuation, which means they score nothing. Some people don't understand the assertions. So even though they see the word, <clears throat> they give lots of tests on other assertions and score nothing. You've got to understand the assertions, otherwise you are about to bomb out on this big time. <coughs> So for this question, you can, oh dear, sorry, sorry, sorry. Get rid of that. On this question, you've got to give tests on valuation only. So think, how is inventory valued? It's valued at the lower of cost or net realizable value. So your tests have got to be check the cost. Agree it back to invoices, purchase invoices. Uh, net realizable value is mostly about sales price. So check the company's price list. <coughs> um, agree post year end sales invoices to see what they've sold things for. And for those items that still remain unsold and are looking a little bit on the old side, ask yourself, will they have to discount those to get rid of them? So if they're selling iPhone 6s, but now iPhone 7s are out, if a new version of a product is out, older ones may have to be discounted and you may have to talk to the sales director about plans to discount things to shift them and see if that net realizable value is likely to end up below the cost. Must understand your assertions. I think the assertions are probably the most important technical bit of knowledge and understanding of the entire course. And the third type of substantive procedures question is where you get a short story. And it will tell you something that's happened at the company. You know, uh, two weeks before the year end, there was a board meeting. The board decided blah, blah, blah. Then they announced it. Shortly after the year end, they started doing it or something. There'll be a story. And the best way of getting tests out of that is test every fact, date, event, amount in the story. <clears throat> if there was a board meeting, there will be board minutes. So inspect board minutes to verify date of meeting and the matters that were discussed. If the company made an announcement after that board meeting, inspect copy of announcement. This may well be on their website in the news section. It may have been announced by emailing it to staff. So inspect the email to verify what was announced and the date. Just use the story to tell you the facts that need to be checked. Now those are the three big uh, core areas which are going to generate the most marks for you. Those are techniques that hopefully you've been practicing up until now <coughs> uh, and you've got to think about how to do this on exam day. Right, we have some questions. <laughs> uh, Julian has made a big life-changing decision and is now Julia but no has given up on being Julia and is back to Julian again. You don't want to make such big decisions with an exam coming up. It's not a good idea. Very distracting. Okay, uh, questions. Let's have a look. So I've got to do the accounting knowledge, no problem. Uh, can you recommend any recent articles that are worth reading before the exam on Monday? I'll do the articles, then I'll do the accounting knowledge that you need. As I have already said, There's an Audit Reports article in PQ Magazine this month, freely available on their website. If you've not seen it already, go take a look.
We have not had any new articles, as I've already mentioned, <coughs> uh, from the examining team in recent months. But if you go and look at the technical articles section for F8, the most recent article looks at assertions, and it's such an important topic. I think it would be very wise to go and look at that. There's also an examiner article about audit reports, which uh, alongside mine would be very sensible reading. And I suppose you could argue pretty much any of the articles that are there are worth a look. <laughs> Thank you, Wayne. Um, any of the articles are worth a look. Uh, pretty much cover everything on the syllabus if you go far enough down the list. Some of the articles are getting a little bit old, but if they're still there, they're very much still relevant. So at this late stage, it's quite a nice way of spending a bit of weekend time not with your head buried in a book or doing loads of questions. Have a little bit of a read. It may enhance your understanding. But to be honest, <coughs> at this late stage, best thing is to be thinking long question technique practicing that a bit over the weekend, doing some MCQs just to keep the knowledge going. But I'd be looking at long questions pretty much entirely. Uh, read the examiner's reports. <coughs> Sorry about this. Too much talking today. At the very least, go and read the last two examiner reports and see what the examiner says are the main problems that students seem to have. Because they're the same every time. You don't need to read that many of these reports, you know. Okay, uh, I have been asked about the accounting knowledge you are meant to have. Again, it is a little late to be thinking knowledge, but here is the accounting knowledge you should have. Accounting standard number one, companies with going concern threats should have a disclosure note <coughs> in their financial statements. Number two, mentioned it just now, inventory should be valued at the lower of cost or net realizable value. Uh, eight. 10, quite an important this one, this one, events after reporting period. So things that happen after the company's year end, if they affect what you know about the company's year end position, they are called adjusting events, meaning debits, credits are needed in the accounts. If they don't affect the year-end position, then they are non-adjusting events. But if they don't affect, but are material, then no debits and credits, but add a disclosure note. So if there is an earthquake after the year-end, well at the year-end there had been no earthquake, the assets are all fine, don't change the numbers. But put a note in telling everyone that there has been an earthquake, what damage has it caused, what financial problems for the company, so the shareholders can understand. <coughs> Number 16 uh, says that property, plant and equipment should be depreciated over its useful economic life. Typically land is not depreciated, but everything else should be. It also says you can, you don't have to, but you can revalue your assets. And if you do, surpluses should go to a revaluation reserve. Uh, if you revalue one asset, you must revalue all other similar types of asset and stuff like that. <coughs> Uh, hey, 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 hey. Uh, number 21 is not on your syllabus. You're not expected to know any of the detail. Uh, but you do uh, need to know 
that if transactions are in foreign currencies, they need to be converted back to your home currency. And at the year end, any amounts outstanding to suppliers or from customers or bank accounts maybe or loans in foreign currency get restated at the year end rate. I'm not writing it down because strictly speaking, you don't need to know it. Uh, <laughs> probably the next one's number 37. Provisions, if an obligation is probable or likely, in other words, uh, contingent liability, which is just a disclosure note, whereas a provision is a liability, debit credit, uh, disclosure note, where an obligation is possible rather than probable. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I have seen the question, by the way. I just want to finish this and then I'll come back to it. 38 intangibles. Uh, these are amortized, similar to depreciation, over their useful economic life. Uh, up until recently, the only intangible we'd ever had <coughs> was uh, development costs. We have had, what was it, a license. Five-year license, I think, came up recently. Uh, but the main one is research and development, which says research costs are expenses. If you're developing a new product, development costs are capitalised at the year end if the company expects to finish and the item, once finished, is likely to sell. Hi, what do you mean one? One, who, he, or hi, thanks. That's about it. We then get into the IFRS's. Uh, worth maybe knowing that if a company's borrowed money during the year, loans, being a financial instrument, have lots and lots of disclosures. And IFRS 15. Revenue is typically recognised one of two ways. When either the goods or services are delivered or possibly, <coughs> excuse me, over a period of time. Now, the second one is more for things like uh, a company is paying you to build something for them and you can recognize the revenue over the period of the build, perhaps, that is unlikely for F8. Generally, for F8, it's that one, when goods move. Uh, and there you go. That is pretty much it for the accounting knowledge. Uh, another question. What are your thoughts about CBE? <laughs> Probably a bit late to be thinking about CBEs, because presumably, if you're sitting next week, you've already decided... Um, I have a few discussions with people about this. Uh, here are my observations. There are two F8 past exams, CBEs, on ACA Global, September and December last year. Why not have a go at them on the screen, and then you can see what it feels like. <coughs> I'm a pen and paper person, I have to admit. I like scribbling things. Now, you can type things as notes and then knock them out at the end. Um, <coughs> I think maybe one of the biggest decisions here is your typing speed versus your writing speed. When we get students to do mock exams here, uh, we give them the opportunity to either write with a pen and then scan it or to type it in on the platform. Most of the ones I mark which are typed, the answers are so short. I think despite the fact that we've had computers for a long time, I think so many people now are used to typing on smartphones rather than like this. I don't think people can type fast enough. Now I might be wrong, but <clears throat> I do wonder if some people need to actually time themselves to write an answer on a keyboard 
and then do it with a pen and try and work out just how quick they are. The CBE is quite neat. Um, I find the fact that it keeps asking me to scroll down to the bottom to make sure I've read everything a bit annoying, to be honest. Um, but you know, it's the third sitting of CBEs now. One would hope if they've had any teething problems, those teething problems are largely gone. So I think, yeah, it probably is personal choice, to be honest. <coughs> Just before you make the choice, have a go at both. See what you prefer. Now, we are two minutes away from the end of this session. Uh, I have answered quite a few questions, and that's good news. I've taken you through the three big core technique issues. But please, please bear this thought in mind. You've watched and you've heard me say things. You may well go away now over the weekend and think about those, and that's all great. None of this technique stuff has any value at all <coughs> unless you do it on exam day. And you have got to think about it to force yourself to do it. As I say to so many people, when you watch someone playing golf, you know, a professional golfer, they no longer have to think about keeping their head still and their body position as much because they've taken so many shots, so much practice, it comes naturally to them. When I play golf, just like when you do exams, we've got to think about the technique to force ourselves to do it. Because the problem with the exam hall is there's so much panic going on, so many things to distract you, it's easy to forget the technique. Which is why I say, write it down at the beginning. Write it down at the beginning of the exam, on the exam paper, and force yourself to do it. <coughs> Apologies for the voice. Uh, I did a three-hour class on another paper immediately before this session, so no gap, unfortunately. Thank you all very much for watching. I hope you found that useful. Spend the final weekend looking at loads of past exam questions. Don't worry too much about the stories. Look at the requirements. Think technique. Explain everything. Be specific. Watch the dates in stories. And if you do all of that, my friends, this is a very predictable exam. No silly stuff comes up. Nothing that's going to scare you. Put the technique in place. And you should do nicely on the long questions. And the MCQs, you'll get what you'll get. Thank you all very much for watching. Very best of luck on Monday. And please, after the exam, email me, Facebook me, throw fruit at me if you like, I don't care. Uh, tell me what came up. Tell me how you think it went. And hopefully the next time we will meet is on one of the higher level papers, P1 or P7, which I teach as well. Good luck, my friends. And good night. That's quite all right. And if you are the same catcher whose mock exam I marked, which I'm guessing you might be, well done.